going to be talking about the woodpeckers that occupy our region. And by region, I really mean the, the greater D.C. region. So parts of Maryland, parts of Virginia, Washington, D.C., right? That sort of central and mid-Atlantic area who you can see when you walk outside in the woods near your home. OK, um, we've got three examples of common woodpeckers here on our title slide. Um, in the world, there are about 240 species of birds in the family Picidae, which woodpeckers are a part of. In the United States, we have 23 species of woodpeckers. And here in our area, we have um, seven, really, we could say eight if you include the very southeastern part of Virginia. But if you're thinking about woodpeckers that you, again, can see in your backyard or outside of your home or outside of work in this region, there are seven species. So we have um, a pretty not too daunting task tonight to learn all of these birds and understand a little bit more about them. So we're going to jump right in here. Um, I wanted to talk about what makes woodpeckers special um, in comparison to, to other birds. Obviously, every bird's got something about it that makes it special, right? But what are those unique characteristics and traits about woodpeckers that make them woodpeckers? And as I mentioned earlier this evening, woodpeckers really are forest birds. They live in the trees, right? And so they have all of these unique behavioral characteristics that um, are indicative of the lifestyle that they lead in the forest, right? Ooh, we've got someone who just joined us, so hang on here. Let me just let them into the meeting. There we go. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Barb. Thanks for joining. You all are now seeing Teams through my computer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just switch back to the slides in just a second here. Here we go. All right. So, Woodpeckers have these unique behavioral characteristics or traits um, that really have a lot to do, again, with the fact that they are forest birds. So they're going to drum, drill, peck, excavate, right? All of these behaviors are um, things that they do to survive and make a living in the forest, right? So when a woodpecker is drilling and pecking and excavating on trees and trunks and branches, they are doing a number of things. Um, one is searching for food. So almost all woodpeckers um, eat predominantly insects and other invertebrates as the main part of their diet. So as they're pecking and excavating and removing bark, they are looking for beetles and flies and bee larvae and caterpillars. There are woodpeckers that will eat nuts and seeds and fruits, um, primarily from trees, although sometimes other plants as well. And we do have woodpeckers that will um, lap up tree sap, which we'll learn about in a little bit. Occasionally, woodpeckers will also eat small mammals and reptiles or other birds' eggs. Um, but I would say that insects really are the primary component of a woodpecker's diet. Most woodpeckers and that's one of the reasons that you're going to see woodpeckers pecking and excavating and drilling on trees. Um, woodpeckers are also going to create shelter in the trees in the forest, and they do this for two reasons. Um, in the fall, you're going to find woodpeckers excavating cavities or holes in trees to spend the winter in, right? They are not hibernators, right? They are active all winter long, but certainly they need spaces where they can get out of the cold and the wind and the rain and the snow. And so in the fall, you will see woodpeckers busy excavating, right? Pecking and drilling and creating those cavities um, to create winter shelters. In the late winter and early spring, you're going to start to see that behavior again. But in this case, right, they are creating those cavities or shelters for their nests. So they're creating a safe place for their babies, right, inside a hollow or hole in a tree. Letting one more individual in here. Hi, Marion. Hi, Marion. Good evening. We're going to switch back over to the slides here. And then finally, woodpeckers um, do something called drumming, which is a way of communicating with other woodpeckers. So we know that most of our birds, right, call to each other. That's sort of the everyday communication that they use to talk to other birds and other species of birds. Um, most birds, particularly male birds, have songs that they use during the breeding and mating season to communicate with potential mates as well as potential competition. 
Um, our woodpeckers don't have songs. What they do instead is drum on trees. So they're going to use that big beak that you see that at other times is used for excavating tree cavities or searching for insects. And they're going to use those big beaks to really pound and drum on trees to create loud sounds that I'm sure we have all heard <laughs> um, to, to announce, right, that they are looking for a mate um, or that this is their territory, right? They don't want other woodpeckers competing in that same area, okay? So over on the right, we've got um, our pileated woodpecker doing some pecking. Looks like it's probably just searching for insects there in that part of that tree, okay? do all of this pecking and drumming and excavating and drilling into trees where woodpeckers live in the forests, right? They've got some really um, unique physical characteristics or adaptations that help them um, survive, right? So beginning with those big beaks that we see, right? They're, they have what we call chisel-like beaks. They are sharp and they are strong. Um, some woodpecker species actually have cells that regenerate on the tips of their beaks, so they're always super sharp, which is really amazing. Um, and then they've got these barbed tongues inside of their beaks that they can stick oftentimes two or three inches away right out of their heads to sort of lap up those insects that they might find under the wood or in the wood. And, and that's what we're seeing up here on the top right, okay? We talked a little bit as well when folks were joining us about why woodpeckers are kind of tough to see or sort of considered shyer birds. They Most of them are very large. They've got these very powerful beaks. Um, so why do we not see them very often? Why are they sort of shy? And um, there are probably a number of reasons for that. I don't know if there's any definitive reason. We talked about one being that they are forest birds, so we're not often likely to see them in our yards unless we've supplemented their diet somehow with suet or bird feed. Um, but they also have what we call disruptive coloration. So I often think of woodpeckers, I think of a joke my grandfather used to tell me about what's black, white, and red all over, right? The newspaper, right? It's black and white and you read it. Um, but I often think of that joke when I think of woodpeckers, particularly the woodpeckers in our area. Almost all of them are black, white, and red in some shape or form. Woodpeckers in other parts of the world come in other colors, but here in our area, you've got that black and white patterning on their feathers, particularly on their backs and their bellies, that really help them to blend in with the dappled sunlight in the forest. You'd think like, wow, something that's striped like a zebra, right? <laughs> Feels like I should be able to see it pretty easily. But no, that coloration really does help them to blend in in the forest where they spend most of their time. They've got what we call zygodactyl feet. So they've got two toes that go one way and two toes that go the other way. And this helps them climb vertically up tree trunks, right? As they're searching for food or excavating a cavity, they've got to be able to support their bodies on that vertical surface. And so their toes that go in opposite directions like that allow them to do that. Most woodpeckers have four toes. There are some species that have three toes, like the three-toed woodpecker, but you're going to find in most woodpeckers those four toes, two going in each direction. To help with that sort of vertical movement up and down a tree trunk, they also have really stiffened tail feathers compared to other birds. So they can use their tail feathers as sort of like an extra prop, which is what we're seeing in these pictures. These birds are feeding at a bird feeder and not on a tree trunk, but you get the idea, right? It's almost like that tail feather acts like a third foot that they can sort of push against the tree trunk and help them to support their bodies as they're moving up and down the tree trunk. Okay. Finally, right, we know woodpeckers spend all this time pecking, right? Um, I read today that on average, most woodpeckers can peck 20 times a second and up to 12,000 times a day. So that's a lot of impact, right? Their faces are hitting the trunks of trees again and again and again in almost every aspect of their lives, whether they're creating shelter or looking for food or communicating with other woodpeckers. So how do they keep from getting concussions, right? They're having this incredible impact I also read today that that impact is as if they are moving at 25 miles per hour and crashing into a tree, right? So that is just an incredible amount of impact. And there's a couple of different things that are happening in their bodies to help them sort of mitigate any damage that could be going on from that repeated impact. So 
Um, one of the first things I wanted to talk about is that their brains actually fit very tightly inside their skull. So we know we've got fluid that surrounds our brain. Our brains sort of have this nice little cushion so they can kind of slosh around inside our skulls and have some cushioning. Woodpeckers don't have that fluid in their skulls, so their skulls or their brains fit very tightly inside their skulls, so there's not a lot of wiggle room. Um, they also have sort of a spongy component of their skull, which is what we're seeing here. The little red square shows you, I think, where their skulls are spongiest, which makes sense, right? That force from the impact is going to sort of move that way. And so that sort of portion of their skull is spongy and soft compared to the rest of the skull and sort of mitigates that impact as well. Okay. Um, they also have very strong neck muscles, so it's not just their head that's moving, right? Their whole sort of body is doing that motion and their neck muscles are, are taking in a lot of that impact. So it's not just their faces and their skulls. Finally, they have what's called an elongated hyoid bone, which is what we're seeing over here on the bottom right. So it's sort of a cartilaginous bone that attaches to their tongue that depending on the location of their tongue is either sort of loose around their skull or wrapped very tightly around their skull. And when their heads are sort of, their necks are elongated and their heads are making that impact, the hyoid bone wraps itself tightly around the woodpecker's skull to help sort of eliminate or reduce right, the force of that impact. So all of these things combined keep woodpeckers from you know flying around with concussions all the time and that sounds really silly to say but there are actually um folks out there who are studying this and trying to put to work some of the mechanics that are involved and design better football helmets for football players so that you know athletes who experience these high impact events in the course of their sport right have a, a better protection based on right this awesome system that's already out there and exists for our woodpeckers. So there's some information at the end of the presentation if you want to learn more and read a little bit more about that research. Hopefully that answers um, the questions that came earlier about how do woodpeckers peck and drill and excavate without injuring their brain. Okay. Oh, finally, one more thing that I don't have a picture of that I thought was really fun and I wanted to share. A lot of woodpeckers have really bristly feathers around their noses, and lots of birds have this. Like our owl here at the Nature Center has some bristles around her beak that actually help her to sort of funnel sound. Um, but woodpeckers have these bristles around their nose to help keep wood chips from getting into their nostrils, which I thought was really fascinating. Almost like, right, wearing a mask, right, to keep the dust and the debris from coming into their bodies, right? Those bristles help keep them, prevent them from breathing in dust and, and wood chips. So pretty neat, okay? Finally, woodpeckers are special because they play a really important role when we think about the forest ecosystem as a whole, right? First of all, they provide some pretty good insect control. That is like the primary component for most woodpeckers' diets, as we've already discussed. So they help to reduce tree pests in particular, right? Beetle larva, emerald ash borer larva all get eaten by woodpeckers. So they provide a great service that way. Um, they also, right, by creating cavities, both excavation cavities when they're looking for food, as well as uh, nesting cavities that they're no longer using, provide homes and shelter for all kinds of other creatures, whether it is songbirds that use cavities to nest, like chickadees or bluebirds or owls, or mammals like flying squirrels, which at this time of year are hunkered down in their tree cavities, often uh, many flying squirrels packed in tightly together to stay warm. So it's estimated that 90% of the cavities used by other animals in the forest were originally created by woodpeckers. Okay, that's just a huge and astounding ecosystem service that they are providing for other forest animals, right? Really incredible. There is some research out there that says they are possible vectors for wood rotting fungi, so they help to spread those spores around for the shelf fungus or the bracket fungus that we see so often in the forest. And then there are general indicators of forest biodiversity and well-being, right? If the woodpeckers are doing good because they are so dependent on trees and on the forest, right, chances are that other creatures in the forest are probably doing okay as well. We can look to woodpeckers to sort of tell us a little bit about right, how the forest is doing overall. Okay. All right. Why learn about woodpeckers in the winter, right? Why are we having this talk 
in January and not in June, right? And that's really because now is a great time to get out there and look for woodpeckers. And this is why, right? When you look up at the tree canopy in the summer, you are going to see lots of leaves and it is going to be very hard to find any woodpeckers. But in the winter time, when you look up, there are no leaves in most of our forests. And so it's a lot easier to spot and find woodpeckers in the winter as we sort of get into sort of late winter and early spring that's the beginning of most woodpeckers breeding and mating season so they are often sometimes a little bit more active drumming more often calling to each other more often again before a lot of the leaves have leafed out so it's a great time to get out there and look for woodpeckers and learn about woodpeckers and practice some of these identification skills that we're going to learn about in a little bit okay hope that makes sense all right so we are going to start now um, with the woodpecker species that we can find in our area, which is probably what most of you were waiting for. I'm going to just take a minute and stretch a little bit. And if you want to as well, that's fine. I have a hard time sitting still for a long time. So doing a little stretching. All right. We, um, we're going to go through these woodpecker species from smallest to largest, and there is some overlap with the species that happen in the middle. So our middle sized woodpeckers are kind of all similarly sized, but we're going to start with the smallest and work our way to the biggest woodpeckers that we can find in our area. And the smallest is our downy woodpecker. For those of you who put out suet feeders or bird feeders, right, these are probably the woodpeckers that are coming to your feeders. Um, they are probably the least shy of the woodpeckers that we have in our area. They're here all year round. They're only about five inches tall. They're not big birds. Um, I know there's some questions about comparing downy and hairy woodpeckers, which we'll get to, but part of it has to do um, with the length of our, our downy and our hairy woodpeckers beaks, their bills, in comparison to the rest of their heads. So if we look at our downy woodpeckers, they've got these itty bitty beaks compared to the, the rest of their bodies and the rest of their heads. They um, are insect eaters. They will eat other things, obviously, if you've had them visit your feeders for seed. They will eat seed, especially in the wintertime when insects are harder to find. Um, and they nest in dead wood, right? So they need those dead or dying trees in the forest. They really prefer trees that are already dead. And like all woodpeckers, they are cavity nesters. So they're gonna excavate a cavity in a dead tree um, to build their nest, which is really just a pile of wood chips. And then they typically lay between three to eight eggs. So our little downy woodpeckers, our males have this little tuft of red on the back. Remember black, white, and red all over. And our females, as well as the juveniles, which I haven't included here, don't have that little patch of red. So there are these teeny little woodpeckers. Um, they've got these sort of stripes or spots on their wings, right? They've got a white breast. And again, the males have that little crest of red on the back of their head. These um, are really nice photos of woodpeckers, right? You, you've got all the characteristics there for you. I've included one that I took here that shows you right you don't always get such a great view. <laughs> but this view does give us a few key things, right? We've got those striped wing bars. We've got um, these outer tail feathers with a few black spots. We've got a really small bird overall, and then that red spot on the back of the head that tells us, yep, this is a male downy woodpecker, okay? Um, I will say for the images that I've included tonight, I think it's important to credit the the photographer so I've done that below the photo if you don't see that information below the photo it's because it's a photo that I took so I'm not worried about crediting myself okay all right moving on to our second smallest woodpecker that's our hairy woodpecker and you can see right when we compare these two oh my gosh they look so similar right we've got these spotted sort of striped wing bars here um, we've got a smaller size woodpecker, although our hairy woodpeckers are going to be larger, right? Our downy woodpeckers were about five inches tall. Hairy woodpeckers are a little bit taller, between seven and ten inches, I'd say it's pretty big, but between seven and ten. They are here year round, so we will see them year round, but they are a little bit more shy than our downy woodpeckers. They are um, less likely to visit our feeders in our yards, so they definitely forage um, deeper into the trunk for wood boring insects than our downy woodpeckers do. 75% of their diet is insects. So that's probably part of the reason you're less likely to see them at your feeders. Um, and that's because insects compromise a greater part of their diet than is the case with our downy woodpeckers who maybe eat a little bit more of a variety. 
okay? The male, again, has that little crest or tuft of red. I keep saying crest, but it's not a crest the way a cardinal has a crest. It's just like a little patch of red back there, a little patch of red feathers on the back of their head. The females do not, okay? I really think of them as being a little bit more stretched out than our downy woodpeckers. Downy woodpeckers, I think of as sort of very round little birds. Hairy woodpeckers are a little bit taller. Okay. When we want to compare the two, okay, we need to be thinking, right, they're very often never going to be side by side. So just getting to know each species and sort of learning what to expect is helpful. But when we break it down, right, our downy woodpeckers are smaller than our hairy woodpeckers. Our downy woodpeckers have that shorter bill in comparison to their head, right? So you can see that bill maybe makes up half the length of their head, but when we look at a hairy woodpecker, that bill is almost long, as long, if not longer, than the length of their head. Okay, that's probably um, the greatest key to distinguishing between the two species is the length of that bill in comparison to the bird's body. Okay. Our downy woodpeckers, like I said earlier, are going to have sort of spotted outer tail feathers. So their outer tail feathers are white with little flecks of black in them. Hairy woodpeckers have plain outer tail feathers. And depending on where the bird is in the tree and where you are on the ground, you may or may not be able to see that, as well as the bit of black feathers that sort of come over the shoulder of the hairy woodpecker. But that's not the case with the downy. So those, I would say, are less reliable because you're not always going to be able to see them. And then again, our downy woodpeckers are more likely to be seen in our yards. Um, they do eat sort of a more varied diet, more likely to visit our feeders, more likely to be sort of hopping and bopping around than our hairy woodpeckers are. So sometimes you have to kind of look at their behavior as well um, and not just their appearance. There is a difference in their calls as well. I will say that I really struggle to hear the difference, but um, there are others, like I said earlier, who are better birders than I am, who could most definitely distinguish between those two calls. So that's another way as well. If you see a bird and you aren't sure, but you hear the sound it's making and you've learned the difference between those two calls, that's one way to do it. All right. Next up is our yellow-bellied sapsucker. These are our winter visitors, right? They're often here from fall through early spring, but they're here in the winter. They breed much further north in the world. So when we look at the range map here, you can see where they're traveling in the summertime to breed. They're only here in the winter, and they're a medium-sized woodpecker, so typically between seven and eight inches tall. The female yellow-bellied sapsuckers um, do not have a red throat but the males do. So you're seeing that difference here. Okay. Again, when you're out and about, right, you might not see all of those identifying characteristics or you might only catch a teeny little glimpse of it, right? In this case, it's really hard because of the lighting to see the red on the head, but I can see a little bit of red at the throat here. So I know that this, whoop, look, I even mislabeled it <laughs> in, my, um, in my presentation here. That's a male yellow-bellied sapsucker. Okay, we call them sap suckers because they feed at sap wells, right? These are holes that they drill into trees where they lap up the sap and then eat the insects that are attracted to the sap. So they're eating both the sap and the insects. Depending on the time of year, that sort of varies how deeply they will drill into the tree, whether they've tapped into the xylem of the tree or the phloem of the tree. And I always get the two confused, um, but I think it's the xylem that brings the nutrients up from the ground and then the flow and that sort of transports uh, everything else all around the tree. So in the early spring, they're gonna be tapping into the xylem as that water and sugars, right, make their way up from the ground up to the rest of the tree. If I've gotten my xylem and flow correct. Um, the same way that people tap into maple trees in the early spring, right, for maple sugaring, okay? So you, um, I will show you in a little bit an image of sapsucker wells. They're really um, easy to distinguish and easy to identify in the woods. They're one of the first signs of woodpeckers that I ever learned to look for, and you often see them. They're really prominent on um, American beech trees because beech trees have that sort of unique way that they scar, and so you can often see them on beech trees. These guys will often um, nest in living trees with rotted wood. So the tree might still be alive, but the part that they've chosen to nest in is maybe a limb that has died or part of the heartwood that has maybe died, but the rest of the tree is still living. 
And they have this irregular drumming or tapping that is characteristic of the species. And I'm going to try to share it with you. I don't know if it will work. Sometimes sound doesn't work so well. So give me one second. Let me just make sure I'm also sharing my sound here. Okay, hang on one second. Yeah, here we go. Okay, hopefully we'll be able to hear this. So I can see a few of us. So lots of woodpeckers, well, all woodpeckers drum. Lots of woodpeckers have a much more regular consistency or regular rhythm to their drumming, right? Yellow-bellied sapsuckers have that rhythm that sort of stops and starts and stutters along. It's been described as Morse code-like, right? You think you're seeing that here. So we'll listen one more time. Again, you're going to see yellow bellied sap suckers here late fall through the winter into the early spring, at which point they're going to be migrating northwards for their breeding season. So they, um, they're they not going to be nesting here. Um, they're just here in the winter. Give me one second. We've got somebody waiting in the lobby. Let them in. Okay. All right. So moving right along here to our next medium-sized bird. Um, this is our red-headed woodpecker. And red-headed red woodpeckers are not particularly common in our area. Um, they prefer woodlands with oak and beech. And further south, they actually like the sort of pine savanna or pine forest habitat that um, our red cockative woodpeckers also really like. Um, because of a loss of habitat, We've lost 70% of our population of red-headed woodpeckers between 1966 and 2010. So that's pretty incredible. Um, for a while, they were listed as threatened. Now, because of better habitat management, um, the population has stabilized a little bit, but certainly hasn't reached the levels um, that we would have seen 100 years ago or more. So their population is on the decline. Sort of stabilizing these days, but certainly hasn't grown necessarily. Um, they are present here all year round and they have been spotted in Arlington, often at um, Fort C.F. Smith and over at Potomac Overlook Park. I've never seen them here at Gulf Branch and again, they're not um, super common. So when you're thinking about learning woodpeckers that you're likely to see, these guys are probably not in the bunch, but they are, um, they've got this really dramatic coloring, right? So in terms of learning a woodpecker, right, there's really no mistaking our redheaded woodpecker. The males and the females look the same as adults. They've got this striking red head. The whole head is red, these solid blocks of black and white coloring. And as juveniles, right, they look very different. They're sort of a, a mottled brown, cream, and white. Um, so very different as juveniles. But as adults, there's no mistaking them, right? This is a redheaded woodpecker. Um, they are more likely than any other woodpecker to catch insects in the air, but they also eat acorns and beech nuts. And they're one of just a few woodpeckers that caches or stores their food for later. And I read today that they are one of the only woodpeckers that actually covers its cache with, with bark or wood to hide it. So there are woodpeckers like the acorn woodpecker out west that caches woodpeckers like crazy. Um, I think our red-bellied woodpecker also will sometimes cache Food, but our red-headed woodpeckers are going to cover those caches and keep them sort of better hidden, which is pretty cool. Their diet is uh, one-third insects and two-thirds plant matter. So you can see, right, they do eat insects. They are uh, a strong component of their diet, but they also really love those nuts, which is why they prefer oak and beech forests, right? They can find acorns, they can find beech nuts, they can find those things, they're happy birds. Um, they nest in dead wood, so they prefer wood that has no bark, right? Um, and typically they'll lay between three to 10 eggs. Okay, all right. 
Our next, probably one of our most common woodpeckers in our area is the red-bellied woodpecker. This is another medium-sized woodpecker, a little bit on the larger side. I would say they're larger than sapsuckers. They're usually about nine inches tall and they're here all year round. So we call them red-bellied woodpeckers. They don't actually have red bellies. I'm gonna skip forward for just a minute. They've got kind of pink bellies that we can see here, right? That little bit of pink down at the bottom, a little bit of pink that you're seeing here. Definitely not red, definitely pink bellied. I wish they were pink bellied woodpeckers, um, but so it is. We call them red bellied. They also prefer um, forests with tree nuts. So oaks and hickory nuts are, are a big component of their diet. Like all woodpeckers, they're going to eat insects and other invertebrates, but like our red headed woodpecker, they will also eat acorns and beech nuts and other seeds, and they will cache food in the wintertime, although they're not gonna cover it and hide it the way our red headed woodpeckers do. Like so many of the woodpeckers we have learned about so far, they nest in only dead wood. And these guys will maybe create a new cavity each year. So some woodpeckers will reuse the same cavity over and over again. Other woodpeckers will create a new cavity each year. And you'll often see this, I've got pictures in a little bit to share with you, but of, um, you know, they'll create one cavity and then the following year they'll create another cavity just below it and then another cavity just below that, right? And those are sort of successive years of nesting that we're seeing sort of written on the forest landscape, okay? Um, differences between the males and the females. Our red-bellied woodpecker has a completely red cap. Our female red-bellied woodpecker has an interrupted cap. So she's got a little bit of red near her beak and then red on the back of her head but up here, right towards the front of her head, are white feathers, not red. Like so many of the woodpeckers so far, we're seeing that disruptive coloration, those bars and spots of black and white that help them to stay camouflaged in the dappled sunshine of the forest. There's our pink bellies. Okay, another medium-sized woodpecker, a little bigger than our red-bellied woodpeckers. These are our northern flickers. Okay, at um. At one point in time, northern flickers were called yellow shafted flickers, and that's because they've got the beautiful bright yellow um, undersides. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen for a second and share these feathers with you so that you can see them up close. Okay, so hopefully you can see the feathers. Um, so these are our yellow shafted or northern flicker feathers. Okay. At one point, um, there's another species of flicker that lives on the west coast that was originally considered a different species. These were the red shafted flickers. Here on the east coast, we have the yellow shafted flickers. And for a long time, it was thought that they were two completely separate species, but they're not. Right? Um, ornithologists now consider them one species, okay, but with different subspecies. So there are like 10 different subspecies of northern flicker. We've got um, the northern flicker here in our area. So we're seeing that all the flickers that you find in our area are gonna have this beautiful yellow shaft or yellow coloring to their undersides, okay? All right, one more thing to share with you while you're seeing me and not my slides. I've got some woodpecker eggs to share with you that actually came from a flicker. So I'll try to hold those up to the camera as well. Okay, here we go. We've got six beautiful little flicker eggs here. And you can see woodpecker eggs are completely white, and that's the case for almost all woodpecker species. And that's because they're hanging out in the cavity, right, that the adult woodpeckers have excavated for them. And so they really have no need to be well camouflaged because they're already hidden inside a tree cavity. So they're pretty round, uh, kind of in the same way that owl eggs are. There's lots of reasons why bird eggs are round. And there's one myth that if they're round, they won't fall out of the tree cavity. And that's been proven not to be true, right? The shape of a bird's egg has more to do with the bird's sort of internal anatomy and the mother bird's internal anatomy. Um, but they are kind of roundish. They're completely white because they don't need to be camouflaged. So most woodpecker eggs are gonna look like this, right? Just be different sizes depending on the size of the bird. Okay. Let's come back and take another look at our flickers. 
Um, they are one of the few woodpeckers that you will find that seeds on the ground. And so I often see them at the feeder in my yard, hanging out on the ground. They're looking for ants and beetles. Um, they will also sometimes eat seeds, but predominantly insects that they're finding on the ground, in dead wood, in the leaves, right, in the grass. They're going to search around. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when we're trying to distinguish between male and female adult flickers, you want to look for this little mustache that the male has. There's a little bit of black hair that you won't see on the female. They both have these really striking feathers. I love flickers. They're so beautiful, right? They've got these spotted breasts, which you don't see on too many other woodpeckers. Oh, you don't see my screen? Thanks for letting me know. Hang on one second. Can everybody else not see my screen? See you. <laughs> there you go. Better? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So again, the, the male flickers have this little black mustache here. Females do not. Otherwise, they look pretty identical. They've got that yellow coloring underneath. They've got this beautiful spotted breast. They've got all kinds of colors and this really bright red triangle on the backs of their head. Um, I took this photo earlier this spring. This is a male flicker drumming um, on the components of the uh, telephone pole in my neighborhood. I don't actually know what this is called. I wish I did. <laughs> but woodpeckers will often drum on man-made objects, so they don't always drum on trees. Um, when I was a child, we had a woodpecker drum on the metal chimney flue, furnace flue of my house. Had no idea what was happening, but finally figured out there was a woodpecker up there. So I'm sure others have similar stories of woodpeckers drumming where maybe you wish they weren't drumming early in the morning. Um, they will use man-made structures to drum as well, right? Things like a metal chimney flue, right? That sound is really gonna resonate and carry really far. So in a lot of ways, they've just figured out how to make you know, our changes to the environment work for them, which is pretty cool. So flickers are an example of a woodpecker that will reuse cavities from the previous year and they'll actually borrow cavities from other woodpeckers if they're feeling lazy, right? If they don't want to excavate their own cavity and another woodpecker has already got one or there's an old one around that another woodpecker made, they'll use it. They're not too picky. Okay. All right. Moving along here to our largest woodpecker in our area. This is the pileated woodpecker present all year round in our area and can be almost 20 inches tall. So really big birds. Um, I'm always, I always love hearing from folks who've seen a pileated woodpecker for the first time because they're always amazed at how big they are. They, um, they do eat insects, right? They love, love carpenter ants. There's research out there that shows that between 40 to 97% of their diet is composed of carpenter ants. So they are looking for ants when they are excavating. Um, in a little bit, I'll show you a picture of pileated woodpecker excavation holes because they are pretty characteristic. They've got a really rectangular shape compared to other excavation holes made by other woodpeckers. And they may force on the forge on the forest floor. So you're often going to find them down low, right? And this is when they appear so big because they're not high up in the trees. They're down at our level at the bottom of the forest. And you'll see them. They're, um, they will often forage on fallen logs, right, trees that are down on the forest floor or just at the very sort of base or bottom of a tree trunk. So as much as they are up high in the forest, you will also see them sort of lower to the ground. Um, and then finally, right, I have here that they, like all of the woodpeckers we've learned about so far, nest in dead or dying wood. And there are at least 38 other species who use cavities created by pileated woodpeckers. So when we think about those earlier we talked about at least 90 species that live in the forest use woodpecker holes 38 of them are using holes created just by pileated woodpeckers and that's likely because pileated woodpecker cavities are so much bigger than other woodpecker cavities right they are big birds those babies get to be quite large so there needs to be a lot of room for them inside the cavity in the tree okay Finally, I wanted to talk about red cockaded woodpeckers, which we are not going to see in our area unless something really unusual happens. These are a southern species of woodpecker that are habitat specialists. So they need um, the pine forests and pine savannas that you find in the southeastern United States, um, particularly old growth forests. They prefer to nest in older trees, not younger trees. And because we have 
so much less of that habitat than we used to, their population has really um, seen a pretty significant downturn. Um, and again, it's because they are habitat specialists. They need this very specialized habitat. They nest almost exclusively in living pine trees, old living pine trees that are large. And they're going to look for food almost exclusively on living pine trees. And so they really need that pine forest. And without it, they're not going to survive. So we do see them in the southeastern portion of Virginia, which is why I included them here. And the males and the females look pretty similar. Here is one in its habitat, right, hanging out on a pine tree in a pine forest, um, doing what it does best. Um, again, not likely to see them in Arlington, but certainly if you travel to southeastern Virginia, there's a chance you could see them if you're in the right habitat. If you want to learn more about efforts that are being done to restore their population, there's a great article from National Geographic here that I've included a link to. So when we're all done this evening, I'll be sending all of the stuff that we've talked about this evening to you in an email. So you'll have that if you're interested. Okay. All right. We're almost done here. Just wanted to talk about what you can look for if you aren't finding any birds. <laughs> um, you can look for those uh, nesting cavities right here. We're seeing sort of successive nesting cavities. The one that is horizontal on the screen is um, from a tree that actually fell and I found in the forest, but you can see those successive nesting cavities that our red-bellied woodpeckers make, right? First one, then the next, then the next from year to year. Here you're seeing it in a living tree. In the middle here, we've got um, the sap wells created by yellow-bellied sap suckers. They're almost always going to create these wells in rows, like you're seeing here. This um, picture is of a white birch, so it's not a local picture. Like I said, I often see sap sucker wells on American beech trees, and I don't think it's necessarily because they favor a beech. I think it's just because beech um, shows its scars so well. So when you're out in the forest, check out those beech trees with those smooth gray bark and you'll often find these sap sucker wells on those beech trees. And then finally, we talked earlier about the rectangular excavating cavities that affiliated woodpeckers make when they're looking for insects, particularly those carpenter ants. And that's what we're seeing here, right? If you've got a rectangular hole in the woods near you, you've had a pileated woodpecker who's come and looked for food. So even though you might not be seeing the bird, there's lots of signs that woodpeckers are out there. You can also look for wood chips on the ground, particularly our pileated woodpeckers that are such big birds and are feeding lower to the ground often will really um, do quite a number on the trunks of trees closer to the ground. So you can look for that as well. Helping woodpeckers. I think this is my last slide. After this, I just have um, a slide with additional resources if you're interested in learning more. So again, I'll be sharing this. You can check that out on your own. But when we think about helping out woodpeckers, right? Tonight we learned about eight different species of woodpeckers. Seven of those eight species need dead or at least partially dead trees to nest in. And if they don't have those dead or dying trees to nest in, right? their young are not going to survive. They're not going to be able to breed and their population is not going to grow. Okay, so if you own your own property and you have the ability to leave dead trees standing or dead limbs, right, as long as they don't pose any harm to people or property, there's no reason you can't leave them standing. That's for everyone to decide for themselves what they feel safe with on their property. But I would encourage you to consider it, particularly if you have larger property, right, and you can leave those dead trees standing without having to worry about them falling. Um, the other thing that I've seen done is um, leaving what we call snag standing. So if you've got a dead tree and you're worried about sort of its crown ending up where you don't want it, have the tree crew come out and cut the crown, right, but leave the trunk, okay? And by leaving the trunk, you still leave room and space for a woodpecker to create a nesting cavity right, without having to worry necessarily about that whole bulk of the crowns falling where you don't want it, okay. Planting native trees, shrubs, and flowers that support insect life. So many of our woodpeckers depend predominantly on insects as part of their diet. So planting plants that the insects eat at various stages in their life will mean that you have woodpeckers in your yard as well, right. So you need the insects to have the woodpeckers. So you need to plant the plants that the insects like, right? So native species that evolved with the insects that live and are a part of the world are gonna be your best bet. 
down here, there's a link to a native plant finder. So you can just type in your zip code and it will tell you native, not just wildflowers, but also native trees and shrubs that are appropriate for our area. And it also tells you, although it's hard to see in this little picture, it tells you how many insects are supported by that native plant. So here we've got oak, right? Oak, you can't tell, but oak, um, it supports more than 500 different species of insect, particularly white oak. So if you're gonna be planting a tree on your property, think about something like white oak that supports, right, this large diversity of insect life. The more insects you have, the more birds you'll have, not just woodpeckers, but other birds too. Eliminating pesticide use in your yard, right? You don't wanna kill the insects because the insects are what the woodpeckers and other birds eat. They need them to survive, so leaving the insects. Leaving fallen logs, branches, and leaves for woodpeckers that forage on the ground, like our flickers and sometimes even our pileated woodpeckers. This picture up here on the left is from a stump in my neighbor's yard. I looked out one morning and here's a pileated woodpecker, right, poking around in that stump looking for uh, carpenter ants. So certainly leaving stumps and logs and branches down on the ground where these um, woodpeckers that do come down to the ground to forage can look for food as well. It doesn't always have to be tidy, right? It can be tidy, right, and still be beneficial. <laughs> so making nice piles of logs or branches, right, you know, making sure that your neighbors are happy, um, but also doing what's best for the wildlife that we share our neighbors neighborhoods with, right? They're also our neighbors. And then finally doing what we can to protect our forests. So I put this little bit in here. Arlington County is in the process of updating our, our forestry and natural resources master plan and we're looking for community input. So if you have thoughts on the forests and natural resources, the soil, wildlife, plants, um, water here in Arlington County, you can share those thoughts and those thoughts and comments will be incorporated into the new plan or into that planning process. And the link is here, right? You can just click the link I know um, at one point the survey was supposed to have been finished in early December, but then they extended the deadline. So I'm pretty sure they are still accepting comments and thoughts on Arlington's natural resources. So certainly feel free to share your thoughts about the importance of our forests and keeping our forests in Arlington, not just for the woodpeckers, but for us as well. Okay. Again, additional learning. If you'd like to learn more about woodpeckers, lots of links to learn more. <coughs> and then there's our contact information if you need to contact us. You can find us on social media, you can send us an email, you can give us a call. One day at some point in the future, hopefully you'll be able to visit us in person again. That would be really nice. <laughs> okay.